welcome to View from the Top. I am Modile Sharafai Yusuf, and I thank you for joining us. Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu is an economist of note who has held many positions in Nigeria, including Commissioner of Finance and Economic Planning in Imo State, Federal Minister of Finance under two regimes, Federal Minister of National Planning, and Federal Minister of Transport. A quintessential statesman, he kindly joins me today, and I'm truly delighted. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I thank you too for tuning in. Before I begin my conversation with Dr. Kalu, here is a brief biography. Born in 1939, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu was ed educated at King's College, Lagos. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in economics and a doctorate degree in economic development and public finance from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's also a Yale Stimson Fellow. He worked in the East Asia and Pacific Programs Department at the World Bank, where he contributed significantly to micro and macroeconomic work on the economies of Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Dr. Kalu, upon returning home, also worked at Scoop and Company Limited as head of the economics division. Along with the ministerial portfolios, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu at different times served as chairman ECOWAS Council of Ministers Chairman African Development Bank, member of the Development Committee at the World Bank, and Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the European Union. More recently, he was appointed to serve on the Special Niger Delta Technical Committee on the Resolution of the Niger Delta Crisis, and was also Chairman of the National Refineries Special Task Force, which was set up in the aftermath of the public uproar that followed the attempted deregulation of petroleum products pricing in January 2012. The National Refinery Special Task Force's number one recommendation was that the federal government should relinquish control of the operations and management of the refineries by divesting a majority of its 100% equity within 18 months. That was in November 2012. At that time, the refineries operated at an average of 31% uh, of uh, installed capacity. But by June this year, we're told that they operate at an average of 10.46%. Yet, the NNPC doesn't seem to be in a hurry to hand over the refineries, or are there no takers? Well, obviously there will be takers. Um, as somebody who was quite uh, instrumental to the whole concept of privatization, the idea is really to move some of these assets that are best handled within the private sector to the private sector. That process is also an avenue for taking the economy as a whole, besides just that sector, to the global market. So they are always takers because once you put it on the global market, those who know the real worth will come forth. And usually you should take along four different bases for selecting those who will be in the shortlist for final bidding. Those who have the money so government can quickly recover its resources to do the things that is better suited to do. Two, those who have uh, experience in managing such an ent enterprise, so they will not be confused once that transaction takes place. Thirdly, there should be people who understand the technology, so they can evaluate, they do the due diligence, and they know exactly what they are getting into. Finally, of course, you consider their sense of what they want to do with this thing once, once they get it. Once you shortlist people on these four criteria, the chances of uh, a non-action or doubts in how it's been implemented will disappear. So uh, it's true, we did recommend an 18-month period within which they should do, do just minor, like uh, dressing up the place and uh, getting it to those who really can deal with it. But there are obviously some more difficult issues that are involved, you know. Well, what have you found out? Well, I haven't uh, quite uh, got to the to the nitty gritty of what the issues are, but I know that there were questions about uh, uh, some people not wanting. You know, there have always been some opposition, all this talk about uh, warehousing it or retaining the workers and so on, you see. But you have to take all those things in tandem. If you're evaluating it, you want to know what staff is there, what structures are there, and so on. But if you don't do that, then some of these issues begin to come up after you've done the transaction. I've tried to inquire. I was told always that uh, it was uh, transparent, but that was just focusing on the pricing uh, issue. But it goes beyond the pricing issue. So I must say I can't really 
tell you conclusively what the real constraints are as of the moment. I also have that some are interested in taking it over. Well, I don't know what process will be involved there, but normally if you want to privatize fully, it has to be open, it has to be not only within the country, but as I said, globally. So you see it advertised globally and you get the best people, whether, whether they're coming from Uruguay or South Africa or, or Netherlands or whatever. Your business is to get the people who really can resuscitate it so that it can begin to now grow. I mean, you move from the 18% capacity, they restructure it, you can move up quickly to uh, what happens in other countries. And uh, when we did our study, we find that some of the northern African refineries were operating at 98%, while ours was at less than 20%, which is really not, not a good idea from every consideration. At about the same time in 2012, the yeah. government promised that, that, that the three proposed greenfield refineries will be functional by the year 2017. Do you know how far down the road we are towards the realization of, of this dream? Well, this is a vexing question because at that time um, we had an offer which I thought uh, was quite uh, uh, appropriate. Refineries are generally contrary to what the general public's view might be. They are not sort of high profit in terms of uh, 35, 40 percent sort of thing. But where you are getting financing, the most crucial thing is that the cost of funds should be much below the, the prospective return, rate of return. And that was, that was the case for the three refineries. Besides, um, there were people who were emphasizing the fact that the source of the offer should also take equity. And I thought, well, it's either here nor there. So long as the thing is appropriate from economic considerations, once you have it in process, you can uh, let the Nigerian public buy into it over time as you produce and pay back. As long as you stuck to that um, uh, projected uh, rates of return in terms of uh, benefit and cost and so on and so forth. So that was another factor, I think, that delayed things. But subsequently, I think, we did go to the same source to obtain funds to do one or two other things, which to some of us may not be as crucial as the refinery sector, as you can see what is happening now. Uh, we thought at that stage that we should immediately stop imp importing finished products. We could refine our own crude in uh, very, very uh, cheaply because refineries were relatively at, uh, at overcapacity in Europe. You take your crude there, you refine it there, and you bring it back as your own crude. And of course, you sell the balance above what you can use. But you know, it's always easy to say this, but within government, there will always be some other considerations which you and I subsequently may not be totally privy to. So that's really what I can say. But I, th I think we've lost quite some time. And uh, it's not unconnected with the petroleum uh, industry bill, which is still pending. In, uh, in the National Assembly. So I think all of this has to be taken uh, along together. The World Bank has estimated that as a result of corruption, 80% of energy resource, energy revenues benefit only about 1% of the population. And the subsidy regime has been identified as one of the conduits for this corruption. Do you think that Nigerians now understand the need for deregulation? Well, we should, we should, but um, Deregulation is really to remove the unnecessary costs of the bureaucracy. It's also to move you closer to the market. And when you deregulate, contrary to what people think, that should really give more resources to government to do just the things that it really should be doing. Putting more into health, into education, into infrastructures, into training, and so on and so forth. And of course, the incomes deriving from those invariably more than compensate for whatever subsidy even on the assumption that that subsidy goes to the intended uh, clients, which is usually not the case. I think by and by, uh, people are beginning to understand that deregulation uh, is, the, is the proper route to go. That's one. What might have been an issue, certainly from my standpoint, was uh, it's not just deregulation, it's not a zero-sum game, a zero, 100%. It is now the process of deregulating you have to take the whole structure of the economy into account. So you make sure that along the line, you are not creating more costs than the benefits. So that would be a reason why you phase it appropriately to make sure that you achieve the desired effect without uh, shaking up the system unduly. 
One of the reasons you, you suggested that petroleum product prices be fully deregulated is to encourage investments in new refineries. Right. Apart from deregulation, what, what other incentives need to be worked out to attract uh, new investments in, in that area? Well, uh, at the general level, you're talking about the entire governance, you know, everything counts. Security, safety, availability of other infrastructures, um, the incentives, pure economic financial incentives have at least to be comparable to your competitors across, over the border, whether you are going as far as Angola or Ghana or any other. So it is that whole package. It's not just a matter of differentials in price, but also all the factors that relate to the, the exercise of those uh, mandates to, to invest locally. The tax structure, the tax regime is very important, and so on and so forth. So it's a whole range of things that come into play for you to be able to get that uh, advantage for the marginal investor who is considering investing in alternative areas. The, the, there were two other committees set up by government at about the same time mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, that your task force was set up. And mm -hmm. One was the Petroleum uh, Task Force on Governance and Controls, headed by uh, Mr. Dr. Suleiman, and the yeah. Petroleum Revenue Task Force, headed by Malam Nuhu Ribadu. Right. Not a lot has been done regarding the reports of all three committees. Do you get a sense that the committees were just sent on a wild goose chase? No, I wouldn't think so. Uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that there was a good intention and that we all know that these are all issues. The tremendous leakages we've been having, uh, the issues that must have prompted the minister, the consultation obviously with her colleagues and of course under the presidency to say we needed to do this. I know a lot of people raised uh, all kinds of doubts about that, but my impression is that the issues were right out there now, how we, how actively, how quickly we move to get to the things that could be converted to policy for implementation, that's another thing, because that also will be affected by whatever else is happening within the government, you know. But there's no question that the, there were issues in every single one of those uh, four committees. I'm quite familiar with the, my colleagues who are heading the other committees, and there were very many issues. No yes, definitely m very yeah. many issues were raised, right. but not much has been achieved since then. That's a question mm. I was asking, and I'm, we're wondering, mm. okay, how long does it take to implement these? Well, uh, knowing the individuals, I, I'm sure it has nothing to do with uh, the difficulties of recommendations or something of the sort. And of course, who best to answer your question than those who will have supervised, uh, who will have sifted this policy issues from these uh, recommendations. And also there, I don't have any doubts about the abilities to do that. So there must be some other uh, non-economic, if you like, perhaps political uh, issues that have impeded uh, what should have been a very uh, clear you know, disclosure arising from these reports on which very clear policies could, could have been made and maybe would have been on a sounder footing on the eve of this uh, current slide in the oil price uh, prices. Is Nigeria broke? Well, I will be in no position to tell you that, but I will rather doubt that. You see, the structure is, is quite robust. Never mind that with the rebasing, we can see the multiple holes in just about every sector, but I don't see how we can be talking about being broke. With the, with, the, with the resources we are still getting in, net of course of the gross leakages, with the leverage that we still have, uh, going broke is almost quite difficult in our circumstances. But that doesn't mean that uh, we're able to now say we're going to do whatever we want to do. So this is always related to the needs of the economy rather than to any absolute amount of uh, government receipts. So from that standpoint, we could see that inadvertently we may have to start withdrawing from some of the things we should, we should think are necessary for us to do. But that is not necessarily tantamount to being broke in the classical sense, you know.